Well, they are deeply disturbing. And, you know, I've got to ask the question, who is actually running for president? Is it Joe or Jill? So I think that that it's Lady Macbeth Jill Biden. I mean, uh, Lady Mick Biden, I guess, if you will. I mean, she is the one who's calling the shots here. And, you know, I, I, I've been speculating that for a while, that she really is the woman behind the curtain, so to speak. And now the media here in the United States seems to be picking up on that. I, I have no idea what she wants. I mean, look, Joe Biden has been in Washington, D.C., for a half century. He first got to the U.S. Senate in 1974. He's run for president three or four times. The first time was before I was even born back in 1988. What more could you want? I mean, you've had the reins of power. And, you know, even holding aside this Lady Macbeth just zeal for power, if you are a wife, shouldn't you have some sense of humiliation and shame when your husband gets out there and just completely embarrasses himself in front of the entire world the way that he did on that CNN presidential debate? Even if Jill Biden is not an American patriot, and I have good reason for suspecting that she probably is not a staunch patriot even if you're not surely you care as a wife to your to your spouse who the most recent reports show there might be parkinson's disease medical experts now coming into the white house it's a mess it's an absolute mess but yes joe biden is definitely not calling the shots he's definitely not the one who's who, who's receiving the classified information every morning in the president's daily brief he's not the one who's making the life or death decisions with the with the nuclear football and again, I, I, as an American myself, I, I gravely fear for this country and everyone around the world ought to care because America obviously is still a superpower, at least at least nominally speaking. Absolutely. It's uh, extremely concerning when the leader of the free world has been reduced to a baby and is no longer calling the shots. And now it's been revealed that for his events, President Biden's staffers actually prepare a short document with large print and photos that include his precise path to a podium. Not that he ever gets it right, but how tragic. I mean, the guy can't even walk into a straight line to the podium without some direction. But here's the here's the irony of all. Okay, so Axios, I'm, I'm happy you flagged Axios. Axios is a liberal Google funded outlet here that is in the tank for, for for Democrats. And Axios, like many of the liberal corporate media here in America, has now gone all in over the past week and a half trying to shunt by an aside. Axios for the for the two years prior to that, two and a half years. Every single time one of us like myself had the temerity, had the chutzpah to get up there and say, oh, Joe Biden's not fully there. Have you seen his mental and physical decline? They would say, shut up, you deplorable right wing MAGA kook. And, and they just said it over and over again. And now, they, now they're flipping on a switch and they're basically just racing. The New York Times, CNN, USA Today, Axios, they're just racing to see who can be the first on any given day, NDNY, to produce the latest bombshell story. Sorry, media, it's only a bombshell to you because you deliberately buried your head in the sand trying to cover for your precious for the past few years. This was not a bombshell to any of us. We all saw this coming there. So the whole thing, again, it would be simply farcical if it were not so utterly dangerous. I mean, my number one thought when I was watching that CNN presidential debate, the, the thought I had over and over again was, Oh, my God. I mean, what conversations are they having right now in Beijing? I mean, you know that Xi Jinping is on the phone with the People's Liberation Army. They're probably saying, let's go invade Taiwan probably the day after tomorrow. So it, it would be merely pathetic if it weren't so actually dangerous. It's spot on. I mean, the White House is more concerned of whether or not the president can walk in a straight line to a podium. Meanwhile, there's actually big global issues out there that are completely being ignored. Now, a former Obama advisor, Van Jones, has suggested that Vice President President Kamala Harris is effectively being positioned as the party's de facto nominee, regardless of President Joe Biden's official status in the race. I mean, talk about desperation. Kamala Harris has been one of the most uh, unelectable people in Democrat history, and yet she's the de facto. Look, Kamala Harris is, is, is a bad politician. I mean, she did not win a single primary vote in the 2020 Democratic Party primary. She was out well before Iowa, which voted first that year in the caucuses. She was explicitly tapped to be the vice president solely for identity politics reasons. And, you know, if that's really the Democrats' best shot, then that says a lot about the current state of their party. But she really is the only viable alternative at this point to Joe Biden for multiple reasons. The one reason is what I just said, is that this is a party in 2022 that selected 
Ketanji Brown Jackson to be their new Supreme Court justice explicitly because she was a black woman. So the notion that they would somehow skip over Kamala Harris to go pick Gavin Newsom or Gretchen Whitmore or anyone who was not a specifically black or maybe Hispanic woman, the notion that they would do that is ludicrous. That's not who this party is. They are an intersectional identity politics worshiping cult to their core in the year 2024. But the second reason why it can't be anyone other than Kamala Harris is because in America, our, our campaign finance laws are, are somewhat complicated, but essentially, if you donate to the Biden-Harris campaign, and right now that campaign has over $200 million sitting in its bank accounts, you can't just then transfer that money to a different entity. That money either sits there or, the, or it might go back to the donors, or maybe it goes to the DNC, the Democratic National Committee. Frankly, it's actually an open question as to whether that money would even stay there if Joe Biden drops out, because say it's Harris Whitmer or whatever, it's a different entity. So it's legally untested as it is, but if they want any chance of keeping that 200 plus million dollars, it would have to be Kamala. But again, the fact that this is the choice the Democrats are facing, I think, says everything you need to know about the current state of their party. Jay, it speaks volumes, doesn't it? That's uh, incredible to hear. Now, look, Donald Trump looks likely to announce his vice president just before or during the Republican National Convention next week. Who do you think he might go with? Well, I'll, I'll tell you who I think he should go with, and he happens to be one of the front runners. So my answer is basically the same both ways. I, I think that he should go with J.D. Vance, who is the young, precocious 39-year-old senator from Ohio, and I'll, I'll explain to you why. You know, a lot of people, when, when they start playing the vice presidential sweepstakes game, they start doing a little checklist. Okay, who fits a certain demographic box? You know, that's why you hear a lot of talk about Tim Scott, because he's a black man in the U.S. Senate, or, or maybe Ben Carson, who was the black former HUD director. And then you see some people talk about, oh, who was in, in, in a certain key state? Okay, maybe Glenn Youngkin in Virginia. To me, J.D. Vance is the best pick for at least two very important reasons. One is, if you get down to brass tacks, the way that you win a presidential election in the United States is via the Electoral College. It is a race to 270 electoral votes. Right now, Donald Trump has a commanding lead in essentially what we call the Sun Belt down here. That's Nevada, Arizona, North Carolina, Georgia, all of the warmer weather states, where it's still sometimes within the margin of error, not always, but where, where it is still sometimes within the margin of error in the polling is the Rust Belt. So Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan specifically. Trump's going to have to win at least one of those three. Now, he's in good shape right now, frankly, in all three, especially Pennsylvania, but that's really where you want to double down. That happens to be J.D. Vance's core base right there. He's a guy from Ohio who wrote a famous book called Hillbilly Elegy. He speaks to white working class voters in the Rust Belt better than anyone currently on Trump's list. And the other reason why I think he's the best pick right now is because, as I mentioned, he's a very young guy. He's 39 years old. He speaks to the discontent that millennials and Gen Z have to the boomers who have spent like drunken sailors who have been trying to march all around the world, invading countries to no avail and so forth. And at a time when Democrats are currently hemorrhaging youth support as it is, I think J.D. Vance can only solidify that exodus of young voters from the Democrats to the Republican Party. Well, it's going to be very interesting. We'll be watching that uh, announcement very closely. Now, just before we let you go, woke activist groups are opposing a sex trafficking bill in California, complaining that it will, would you believe it, harm the LGBTQ community and people of colour. Listen to this. Studies have shown that LGBTQ people, particularly gay and transgendered individuals, are more likely to be charged with sex offences compared to their heterosexual counterparts. For instance, LGBTQ individuals are nine times more likely to be charged with sodomy. Measures like SB 1414 lead to higher rates of incarceration, longer sentences, and increased difficulties in finding housing and employment. I mean, we can hardly be surprised, Josh, that this is a sort of response we get from the woke activists. What on earth is going on here? So, look, I mean, if you're trying to pass a bill that is a child safety bill, Probably the number one thing that is happening in America and in all Western nations across the world, for that matter, that is the antithesis of child safety is genital mutilation and chemical castration that comes about via so-called gender-affirming care, which is currently one of the greatest things that the LGBT rainbow movement has going for it. I mean, they very much adore these so-called gender-affirming surgeries. Again, I refer to it usually as chemical castration or, or genital mutilation. So it kind of just goes without saying that if you are part of this woke LGBT mafia, then you are going to oppose a bill in the name of child safety. But, you know, I, the silver lining is when I see a story like this, that the people who come out in opposition to a common sense legislation like this 
they're only ultimately making a fool of themselves. And if you are kind of a, a sensible, moderate, middle of the road person out there still trying to decide where to put your political loyalties, you see a video like that and you say, wow, I want nothing to do with them. Uh, you're spot on. I think many people can uh, share that view. Josh Hammer, thank you for joining us.